the Maria Hamlefosch was appointed chairwoman of the Swedish Booksellers Association. In 2019, after a long career in the book industry, previous positions include CEO of Akademi Bokhandlen, yeah. Bokus, Norstedt's Publishing, and Thompson Corp. in Sweden. She was also director of the Sweet and Maxwell Group in the UK. We're here in Prague at the RISE Book Selling Conference. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. Your job is to what? Well, we are an association for brick and mortar bookstores. Basically, we have around 260 members out of the 300 bookstores in, in Sweden, and we try to be their voice and uh, provide some services for them. What kind of services? We do, we have a couple of projects that we run together. So, for instance, every spring we organize something we call the World Book Week, which is focused on uh, children and uh, encouraging children to read books and invite them to bookstores, etc. So then we as as an association, we also collect and, and publish statistics on, on book selling in our market to, to guide our members and, and others who are actually interested in our in industry about what's happening over the years. We're also in touch with politicians, publishers, I mean, trying to be, be the voice of, of, of our members and, and raise awareness of, of book selling in the market. The population is around 10 million, is it? Mm -hmm, yeah. That's right. How many English language books sell versus Swedish? The amount of English language books uh, is, is actually growing, and in 2022 it was 16% uh, of the market. That has increased uh, over the last few years, so we see a tendency of both. Uh, TikTok titles or booktok titles yes, making yeah. it to the to the top lists and we also see mm. more and more people actually reading uh, non-fiction English right. uh, language so we, we publishers are starting to talk about a situation where it doesn't make sense from a commercial perspective to translate uh, especially then English language titles into, into mm. Swedish because it's sweet, uh, English is uh, taught in schools and... Yes, yeah. every, every child yeah. uh, is taught English. Yeah. I think it's nowadays from the age of 10 or so. And, you know, we have a lot of, obviously, English language material on TV and films, etc. So Yeah. So your language protects you from foreign ownership of the publishing sector in the country then? I think you can say so, both for ownership of the publishing sector and also ownership of the publish of, of the book selling sector. That, that's uh, true. There there is now a situation where there is some ownership across across borders in the Nordics, and we all have our own peculiar little languages. <laughs> that uh, but still they are a bit different, so they are not all the same. And a lot of the both publishing companies and uh, booksellers are family-owned businesses that have been in operation for for generations actually so there is quite special we have we have members many members that are more more than 100 years and wow. we're f the fourth generation now are, are running the bookshops hmm how is the industry is it thriving could you say that or is it hurting, or where is it? No, I think it's it's challenging and has been challenging quite for for quite a few years, especially in the since the last or during the last say twenty twenty five years when uh, uh, internet bookstores have taken more and more share of the market. It's been become more and more competitive, and it's also a competition on price. Cause yeah, because uh, the online uh, actors typically operate. At a lower price point, and and uh, and the, all the brick and mortars have really had to adopt to that and become more efficient in order to be competitive. So I'd say a lot of uh, 
it, a lot of the businesses have not really high margin, but um, you know, there is a lot of a lot of engagement for for literature and, and a lot of people wanting to bring good books to the world, and, and that actually drives the industry, I would say. And you say that Amazon has just recently entered the market. Yeah, a little more, more than a year ago uh, they entered the market, and obviously they they have books, uh, they do sell books, uh, but they also sell lots of other things, and, and they haven't really made an impact in, in our market. Uh, I think from 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 the book selling perspective, we already had two very very efficient uh, actors in, in in that field in the market with high market share, you know, good customer service, good deliveries, uh, low prices, uh, ten million titles, English language titles, or all, all the other foreign languages. So mm. Amazon didn't really bring anything new to the market, I would uh, say. But there are they obviously see a some sort of future there. I guess they do, and the, yeah, you know, they do sell lots of things, <laughs> and and yes. uh, so I think they probably uh, they are probably more uh, successful in other areas. Yeah. Even though I understand that they have been, I guess, a bit disappointed uh, about the uptake because the market is already very, you know, well penetrated with online. What uh, What do you see uh, uh, as the Product other than books. What are booksellers selling then? It used to be like office supplies for smaller companies and and that kind of products, but that market has also really declined um, mm. as all all businesses have become more digital. So uh, in recent years, uh, I think we can see more consumer oriented. Products, but it's it still may be notebooks, calendars, pen. Connected uh, with the creative writing, yeah. reading. Yeah, yeah. art uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. um, depending, on, I think it's it depends a lot on where your your bookshop is situated and and what other stores are in the neighborhood. I mean, mm. in in a smaller town, if you have a an independent bookshop, they may also be selling toys, for instance. If there is not a toy store in that small right. town, they will they will sell toys. So I think it really uh, depends on, on the local market situation. Mm -hmm. what, what about, uh, not pr a product, but uh, is there anything else that they're selling, do you think? Like some sort of experience or...? Well, there is uh, in the market a couple of concepts that are more like a lending services. You pay a, a, a sum up front and then you get one book and change that book for another book. And once the year is over, you, you, you can keep uh, the last book. That's a service that is quite, uh, mm. quite popular. Mm. Among Swedes, uh, and also good from a sustainability perspective, I guess. And then uh, events is really, really, really big. So all sorts of e events uh, could be in store, of course, and some some also organize uh, events in a like a town hall or wherever they are in a larger hotel, etc. So it may be, you know, quite small events like an author coming for a couple of hours signing or an evening with lots of different authors and people paying an, an entrance fee and, and you know a celebration of, of literature and reading so I'd say that there are thousands of, of uh, activities like this going on on a yearly basis. And what would you say the value to society of Bookstore. I'd say in, in many instances the bookstore is really like the cultural hub, really important to uh, both make a, a city centre attractive um, but also bring the, the kind of value as, as the bookstore can with, with like an intellectual uh, spot in, in, in your town. A lot of people discover that during the pandemic and, and uh, hopefully an increasing number of landlords uh, also appreciate uh, bookstores. Is the, is the government doing anything to promote this? 
Nothing really targeted at bookstores. There are some funds available for initiatives that promote reading and, and uh, bookstores can also apply for, for such funds for, for projects. So that's, uh, that's available to us. Like what? If you want to arrange, uh, say, events focusing on children and, and reading, you can uh, get some project man- money from a government organisation, if you are fortunate. There is some government support for publishing of certain quality titles, but they are merely interested in them being published, not sold, as I, mm-hmm. I usually argue. And, uh, well, that, that's about it, actually. Yeah, so it's a very, I mean, it's a, f- a free market with very little government support. And when there are no support systems in place, it's also, you know, government becomes ignorant, I'd say, about the, the situation in the industry. And uh, mm-hmm. so there is quite a lot to do, I, I think, to just uh, spread the word and, and inform. There are fixed price policies in play in France and Germany and Italy and Spain. Norway. Norway as well. Yeah. Yeah. They have their language to protect them. So, uh, you know, if the prices in Germany for German Mm. books have to be a certain amount, it doesn't really matter that much. Whereas Mm. in in English-speaking countries, uh, you can get English language books all over the place, mm. right? We did have fixed prices until now, 1972, so it's 50 years ago. And then I think, uh, you know, I, I wasn't really in, in the industry then, but what I understand, it was really the publishers that, that wanted it, wanted to take it away. So they could discount their own books? Well, drive, drive the market, make, uh, you know, books attractive for more for more channels yeah. and yeah. Uh, by then it was really the book clubs that we, which were held by them actually owned by them that they wanted to promote and, and then it has been sort of developing since since then so we don't have the protection of a of a fixed price and but we are not asking for it either i think what i heard some figures from uh, germany or i or maybe no i think it was actually france they had done customer research and and customers perceived books being cheaper from Amazon than from the physical bookstores even though it was the same prices I mean it's just perception yeah yeah. and books I mean they are very cheap aren't they I mean we we, it's uh, it's not an expensive product so I think uh, our members have really had to uh, sort of reinvent themselves think about what is the value we bring to our customers is there anything else than price we can talk about see the value of service seeing the value of the knowledge the staff has seeing the value of um, instant delivery uh, events the things we talked about creating an environment that is inspiring for people when I worked as a as the CEO of uh, the bookstore, the major bookstore chain, we really had to. Which was that again? Wait. That was the Academie Bookhandel. That's uh, I like our Barnes and Nobles or or uh, yeah, whatever you want to compare with. That, yeah. that's the major. Uh, yeah. or the only actually. Right. It, it became the only. We really had to realize that we needed to focus much more on on service and being active. Our staff members needed to become more active uh, in the, you know, in the relationship with the customer. We used to be in a corner waiting for somebody to ask questions, but we we needed to become more active in our service uh, offering. And uh, yeah, that was quite an interesting journey. What about the pay? That's the thing you want to attract qualified. I would say that has never been a problem. It's been very attractive to work for bookshops, very low, almost too low staff turnover, I would say, you know, a lot of people being attracted by working in bookshops, a lot of, a lot of high quali- highly qualified people. But were they adequately paid? I'd say so. 
because uh, that's one of the concerns in North America is that people who work in bookstores make lousy money. No, I wouldn't say so. Not in Sweden? No, I wouldn't say so. Their work was valued. Absolutely. Whereas in North America, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be quite the mm -hmm. case. It was like a middle class living that they earned, was it? That mm -hmm. they could have raised a family and have a, mm -hmm. and a house and a, you know, the whole bit. Yeah. Yes, that's the case. Yes. Because I don't think it's the case in, okay. in North yeah. America. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't get rich from, from working in a bookstore. No. And you don't get rich from owning one either, <laughs> typically. No, no. There are some people who go into a bookstore, don't bug me, I just want to browse. I want the fun mm -hmm. of finding my own stuff, thanks. Yeah. But if, if it's general knowledge that these people are valuable resources who can really have an interesting conversation mm -hmm. with you and can set you on a wonderful yeah. journey, yeah. I think that's that's important to get that message out. Absolutely. I mean, if you if you are a customer and you want, you know exactly what you want. Yeah, then you can buy then, it then online. Then you go online. Yeah. But if you, I mean, we, we see that a lot of the books that are sold in, in bookstores are actually gifts. It's something you buy for someone else. And if I'm going to buy a book for my mother-in-law, uh, or if I have a niece who is 12, you mm. know, the, the, the advice I can get from the bookseller is, is highly valuable and that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the service. So it's really their knowledge and their willingness to, to help. I think it is a big, 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 big part of the value proposition of a bookseller. Mm. And that's, therefore, I think it's very important that we have bookstores where people go shopping, I mean, that they are available and, and they are, you know, open well, long hours and uh, that they are both in shopping centres and in, in the centre of, of smaller towns, that they are just available, um, both for gift shopping and for uh, when you want to, to buy books for yourself, for your family. What do you think about the argument that, that bookstores are um, advice on reading materials and uh, it's a way of promoting a more intelligent, more uh, engaged citizenry that uh, might object to fascist tendencies in uh, politicians. Mm. Is that a bit of a leap or not? I think those questions are really, I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult topic, isn't it? But I, I, you know, my belief is that if you have a community or if you have a, a generation of, of, of readers that have meaningful and interesting and high quality uh, literature, available that is that is good for a society and that's also why it's so important that children actually learn to read and, and get to know books as, at an early early stage both at home uh, and uh, at school of course uh, mm -hmm. so I think we do play an important role here but it's obviously very diff difficult uh, questions it is, yeah, and it's not uh, it's not black and white either. I mean, I don't know what the sort of the education level of Germ young Germans was in the thirties. Mm. It didn't inoculate them against uh, mm. against fascism. But, but I think we have an overall tendency, don't we, in most societies now that people are or many people are more hesitant to listen to science or to believe in science and we are more and more and more skeptical and there are so many new uh, channels for disinformation and uh, conspiracy that, yeah, yeah conspiracy as well theories yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we have a public services or public service uh, company in Sweden, we have one for TV and one for radio, and then we have one focusing on, on education, uh, and I'm the chairman of the board of, of that uh, company, and uh, 
Is it a company or an association? It is a company owned. The government owns a trust that owns three publishing companies okay. to keep really keep the distance from uh, politicians or and politi- uh, political influence of the business. So, but we do uh, focus quite quite a lot on uh, uh, on this area of uh, skepticism and you know how how shall you evaluate different kinds of sources and how how do you discover disinformation for instance so that's i think it's a very i mean it's a very important mm-hmm. and difficult uh, area and topic and i think also book selling publishing it all it's i mean basically it's it's part of our democracy yeah it's also it's also promoting critical thinking yeah uh, it's quite shocking the number of people out there who do believe in conspiracy yeah. theories. It's uh, you know, we're in a bubble here. I think. I mean, many have have become so critical in their thinking they mm. don't trust science. I mean, so it's also you need to learn both to be a critical thinker and also to be able to trust mm. good sources and good knowledge, uh, don't you? Yeah, I don't know if you can teach trust. It's but it's something that you sort of arrive at yeah. after doing your critical thinking, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yes, yeah, I think uh, you're right. So, winding down a bit, how does your experience in the publishing world, how did that inform the work that you did in the bookselling world? Uh, well, I think it's that's an interesting question. I think if, if I would have a chance to do my career all over again, I would do it the other way around. I would start in bookselling because I would then uh, get to know uh, the needs of the customer and the perspectives of the customer and that would have been useful when I worked in in publishing. Uh, Having said that, when I was appointed the CEO of this bookstore chain that I was in 2012, we were almost bankrupt and uh, it was a very, very difficult situation indeed and I had to take lots of very difficult and uncomfortable decisions and uh, people were laid off, stores were closed and all that and actually I think I was able to to do all that because I came from publishing so my employees knew that I was a book, lo- book lover as much as they were so I think uh, I had actually... You weren't just a bean counter? No, you know we shared the, the, the interest in books and the love for books and uh, they sort of felt that my intentions were good even though it was uh, it was a lot of difficult decisions that we needed to make and a lot of difficult actions taken. What drove your actions then? Uh, profitability. I mean, we wouldn't have survived uh, without, uh, we merged uh, two chains. Was it just a cost-cutting exercise? Uh, In the short term, it was a cost-cutting exercise. Otherwise, uh, those businesses wouldn't have survived. So it was really, I'd say, one year or a year and a half of very, very difficult uh, decisions and a lot of very speedy cost-cutting measures. Uh, but we did also, in, in parallel, work with our brand and our customer offering because we had this competition from cheap online. Yeah. Uh, so we, re- we also had to sort of in- reinvent our offering and how we looked upon ourselves. And we had to find out what is actually the value uh, that you bring to customers. And I think if you have been around as an industry for 100 years, you don't really reflect on those things. You just, you know, everyone knows what a book- bookseller is, mm-hmm. don't you? And, but mm. you, you need to, well, today, in 2020, was it, what is a bookseller then? What would, do we need to be? Uh, and how do we express that in our communication to our customers? And uh, uh, 
uh, we started to become more, I think, professional from a retailer's perspective. So, so the management team I appointed were coming from other parts of retail, not really from bookselling. They came from other parts of retail and were really good at, uh, you know, purchasing, logistics, marketing. But still, everyone had had this heart for books and, and the heart for for bookselling and. Uh, but they were really, you know, very, I think, professional people in in uh, retail. Mm-hmm. I mean, because mm-hmm. that's what that's also a perspective of, of book selling. You have to be a, an efficient retailer. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm trying to get at too, though. Is what conclusion did you arrive as to the value proposition then? It was a lot about service and being active. It was also a lot about how we um, exposed the products in the stores, showing the face of books rather than the back of books. Face out, as opposed to the spine, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, also being more careful about how many titles we had in the store and maybe you know be more active uh, to curate our offering we started a, a customer a club for our customers a customer club which was enormously uh, successful actually so we had more than a million members i, th- I think it took less than a year wow that's uh, out of a population of 10 million yeah what was the incentive to join that club then uh, we, we choose to make all our best offers available to members only. Well, it's a money proposition. Well, it's uh, the best prices that you could get was uh, to become a member, and then you would always have the, the you know the best prices, and those prices would be uh, competitive uh, versus the online bookstores. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. Um, so it. It was really, you know, creating loyalty, I would say, mm-hmm. and, and uh, drive consumers to, to come to the stores. And of course, to us, it was also a way of collecting uh, customer data to be able to do better analysis mm-hmm. and also uh, to be able to communicate digitally with our customers. Yeah. And now, you know, I, I left the, the, about the company in, in 2018, and I think they have probably close to a couple of million members now and it's really you know it's it's great to drive loyalty and I think there is something in book selling that we manage to uh, take advantage of and that is that consumers really care that I mean they care about bookshops they care about books they do like them and and if you give them a chance to to express their loyalty they they will yeah so i i suppose that as you say it it's we've now got a club if you want to support your uh, local even if it is a chain yeah if you want to support what we do here's a way to do it yeah i mean plus you can save money yeah and they and they would Right. And I think, you know, as we have so few bookstores in our country, there, there are few situations where there is actually competition between two brick and mortar bookstores. Right. It's mostly you're competing with online yeah. who don't have the expenses yeah. you do. Right. So it's, we don't really have a, a discussion about independence versus chains. I mean, no. it's a bookstore. <laughs> and right. where it's your local bookstore, whether it's an independent or it's a, it's a store within the chain. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still your local bookstore that you care about. Okay. What about you, your, your life, the way you live your life? Has uh, your love of books and involvement with books, uh, what, is that, what has that taught you about life? You are asking big questions. <laughs> well, I haven't. I never. I never used to ask these, but I've started to think yeah. like these big questions are. Mm. They're kind of important. So. Uh. Uh, I can say I, I've always been a reader. I was read to when I was a child, and I've I've always been a reader, 
myself and, and I've always read a lot uh, but I think it has been for various reasons it may have been to learn something new uh, to relax to have like a more cultural experience so I've uh, books have played different roles in my life over time I'd say yeah, I want life advice from you <laughs> based on all the reading and the uh, work you've done but I think you know there is always there is always a book you know what, whatever you're dealing with as a, as a person as a parent uh, as an employee as a CEO as a tourist as a you know whatever hobby you have there is always uh, there is always a book I mean and and there, are always, there have always been books in my life from, well, for all, all sorts of, of reasons. And then having worked, you know, I worked for, in publishing actually most of my, my career. Uh, and first for Thomson for, I think it was 12 years, and that was professional publishing and legal publishing. And uh, that was obviously, you know, you have an, that was important. Uh, the, the, products we brought out from from uh, that company and I then I worked in in educational publishing for a number of years and that all was all was also important and I, then I turned to fiction and it was all publishing but very very different publishing but it has always felt very meaningful yeah uh, uh, as did uh, my, my last years of my career in in book selling I think that's it has really been a privilege in my career, you know, in my entire working life, uh, to work with with books and uh, that kind of products in, in different ways. And you work with the people that are engaged in what they do as well. That's also uh, fantastic, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it uh, yeah, brings joy to your to your both your working life and your private life. So what's the advice? To whom? To someone working in book selling? To, to may, maybe to your, to whomever, to, to whomever. someone you love, someone yeah. who you want to just help them along with their life yeah. in, in, with some words of wisdom. I think if, if you work in the book industry, I would say that the, the major thing is to know uh, your customer and to be interested in your customer. Yeah, no, no, it's not, that's not good enough. Oh, it's not good enough, but it's true. No, I know, but that's a business kind of advice. Okay. I, if you refer to a more general... Um, a life well lived. Yeah, make, make books part of it. Okay, that's... that's that's yeah. that's great advice. It will give you, I mean, it give you something in your life, and you will always have something to talk to people about. Actually, yes, yes. So it's both something you do on your own, uh, and which feels good for you, but it also builds bridges between people. That's great advice. Thank Was you that very all right? much. Thank yeah. you. I've been a business person, you know, my yes, life. Yes, I so understand. That's, and I, but I've, I understand. I've lived at the same time. Yes, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> well, thank you. I've been speaking with uh, uh, Maria Hemrifosh. Yeah. You will be taken for a sweet. <laughs> well, uh, I've got the wrong color hair, but... Who is the uh, chairwoman of the Swedish Bookseller Sellers Association, located in Stockholm? Sweden. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you.